All right. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, March 20th, 2015. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, and we've got an action-packed show for you today. We're going to be talking about uh, Mars One, some uh, some problems with Mars One, uh, but uh, rings around another asteroid. Uh, what's that white spot on uh, Ceres? Um, oceans on Ganymede. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider, and some updates from the uh, LPSC, Lunar Planetary Science Conference. So, joining me this week, we've got some regulars. We've got Dr. Brian Koberlein. Hi. Dr. Koberlein. We've got uh, Morgan Renberg. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. We've got Dr. Pamela Gay. Wh what? Why is she here? This is awesome. It feels like we somehow across the streams. It feels like it's astronomy cast. It's the weekly space hangout. What's going on? I, I'm just trying to make my way back to my roots. That's all. Awesome. Well, these are your roots. <laughs> uh, and we've got a special guest joining us this week. One of my favorite science journalists, Lee Billings. Hey, Lee. Hey. Thanks for having me, Fraser. I'm not that special. Come on. And I also have the the worst lighting of everybody in here. I've noticed, but hopefully that's okay. Well, that's okay. We're going to help you turn pro. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who don't know, Lee is uh, is the author of Five Billion Years of Solitude, which is a great uh, book about exoplanets. And we had him last time, and you know he pitched his book, and we gave him a chance to try and sell a few more copies, which was great. Uh, but his other job is that he's an editor of Space and Physics for Scientific American. Now, maybe you've never heard of this. It's a magazine. Uh, it's on paper sometimes, but they also have a web version. And uh, you know, it's a young upstart. You might want to check them out. You know, hmm. Whatever we can do to help Since out. Since 1845. Since 1845. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, let's get cracking. So I think the man, the big news, and it just uh, breaks my heart, uh, is what's going on with Mars One. So I thought I would start with that um, and kind of get a get a bit of an update. And uh, so Morgan, you have been you've been following this with great interest. What is going on with Mars One? Yeah, over the last few months, I'd say, we've kind of been slowly watching the wheels fall off of the Mars One idea. And, of course, this was the notion that we'd send uh, a crew to Mars uh, using privately raised money, mainly through television contracts for basically the reality show they were going to produce uh, of the astronauts' experiences on the way to Mars and then once they were on the planet. Uh, but they've had a lot of difficulties naturally uh, raising funding for this. A couple of weeks ago, they lost uh, their television partner. And uh, this week, one of their sort of finalists for being one of these astronauts went public with some of the sort of internal details about how these selections were made. Uh, and it doesn't paint them in a particularly good light. They've basically been asking for contributions from the candidates themselves. Uh, in the form of purchasing things from their gift shop, uh, as well as donating three quarters of any fees that they receive uh, for speaking with the media or public speaking or anything like that. Uh, and this has led a lot of people to suggest this feels more like uh, some sort of scam now than uh, an honest effort to try to land on Mars. Uh, Lee, what's your take on this? You've been following it. Well, I feel like th um, a lot of the stuff the, the in, internal politics that, that has come to light in the past several days, past week, uh, it is of less relevance, really, than just the, the, the fundamental technical difficulties that they're going to have in trying to get to Mars in, in any sort of time frame like they've been projecting. Uh, so, so another thing that, that actually, uh, Morgan just gave a very nice, thorough, uh, broad explanation of, of the latest stuff. Um, another thing that, that's happened recently is that they were, I believe, in um, <clears throat> discussions with uh, an aerospace contractor to uh, study uh, potential uh, robotic missions that could be precursors to having some sort of colony on Mars. Uh, that study has now been uh, completed. That work is done, uh, and there's no, there's no real, I guess, kind of, there's nothing else beyond that, beyond this initial study that they did. And I, I, off the top of my head, actually, I, I'm unprepared. I don't remember who the uh, which which aerospace contractor it was? It might have been uh, Lockheed Martin. It might have been Boeing. Uh, I'm not positive. But the point is, is that um, uh, that you know they, they were using that that name to kind of give themselves some legitimacy, and now it's kind of like the you know the, that that company is saying, well we're we're all done. We did everything we need to do, and there's been no other contact that we've had with with this organization. So um, I mean, there's there's other little things like that that have been happening. Uh, but yeah, fundamentally, it, it's just uh, 
it just seems like a, like an extreme long shot. It seems to be kind of taking advantage of uh, starry-eyed dreamers out there who want to live and die on Mars and, and don't really have a good sense of just head there. So it's, it's, it's yeah. a long, long shot, I think. Uh, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit actually on Astronomy Cast as well. And Pamela, what? Uh, how do you feel about the uh, about the prospects of this and sort of what's happening more recently? Have you been following it? I, I have, and and I have to admit, it's been something of a relief to me to see the project fall apart. And this is because the amount of psychological studying that you really need of the candidates has never happened. Um, if, if you think about it, you're looking to take on a group of people who will one by one watch each other die over hopefully decades on the surface of Mars, and you want to make sure that these are people who are not going to go crazy and kill one another in the process or make way make each other want to die in the process. But that would make good television. It would make no, I think if it was actual real people and not an episode of the X Files. Um, they, they were looking to create an episode of The X-Files, and what I actually want is a really boring science documentary. Uh, sometimes you want things to include really sound people who make bad television, and going to Mars, you want this level-headed people that, well, it, if you've read... Um, Oh, I just totally forgot the name of the book, the book that recently came out about the poor fellow who ended the up... Martian. The Martian? Yes, The Martian. If you've read The Martian, it gives a good representation of the type of person you want, the solid engineer who doesn't panic, who can think his way through really hard situations. They were looking to make good TV. They weren't make, looking to make a successful mission. And I'm kind of glad to see the thing that was going to put a bad taint on space exploration just kind of go away. Uh, the guy who spoke out this week uh, also addressed some of those issues. He said initially they were supposed to have several days of physical and psychological evaluations uh, to determine whether or not they'd be fit. And I think we can all debate whether several days is even close to enough. Uh, but in the end, they didn't get several days. They got a 10-minute Skype interview uh, where the chief medical op officer of Mars One quizzed him about some basic facts about uh, Mars and about the Mars One program. Have you ever certainly. had space madness? Yeah, you, certainly not what you'd expect to see. Do you think you might get space mad? Has anyone in your family ever had space madness? Uh, Brian, what do you think? What's your take on this? I know you've reported on it a bit as well. I, I'm, I'm glad it's falling apart. I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the same with Pamela. I mean, this is, this is cutting-edge stuff. This is, um, it's going to push the mental faculties of the people who go to Mars to the limit. Um, and this is not something that you want to make as a reality show. Yeah, I, it's like like someone should just go and spend ten years in the Canadian Arctic. Like the next step is go on up to Baffin Island and enjoy ten years alone on the Canadian in the Canadian Arctic. And and then if you come through that and you still want to go to Mars, which is incomprehensibly more difficult and remote than than that terrain, then you might be psychologically prepared and and really understand what you're getting yourself into. So, uh, it's, but I was all on board. I think I was, you know, less negative than the rest of you folks, except that hearing that the contestants are being asked for money, that's tough yeah. to stomach. That is not cool. So, I don't know if this is really happening, uh, but if that's the case, then then I think that's not that's not a good way to do this. Yeah, there, there's a place and a time for commercial space, and there have been many excellent people who have gone up to the International Space Station as part of commercial travels, but that was known fine night, rich person buying ticket. It wasn't a, let's go off and colonize another world. Oh, mm -hmm. by the way, can you pay for it yourself? Uh, uh, you so know, I just want to emphasize oh, go ahead, Lee. something that you said, Fraser, really quickly, which is simply that... Um, you know, yeah, of course, I think everyone that's talking right now and everyone on this Hangout probably wants a successful uh, human Mars mission to occur and something like colonization to eventually occur, right? And, and you just want that to happen mm -hmm. in the right way or in a responsible way, in a way that doesn't, as, uh, as Pamela said, taint the entire endeavor. And, and the real threat and risk and worry here, other than, than, than the, the potential uh, damage to the psyches and the, and the physiques of the people who are going, the, you know, they're, them dying in some terrible accident, is... What it could, the damage it could do to just yeah the broader effort and the way that, that people could look at this and see how it fails and see how it's 
a scam, if you want to call it that, or at least a flawed idea um, with no very little hope of, of succeeding, and think that that's going to be how all concepts are. That's how going to be. That's how all missions are going to go. So, so I think that's the key to distinguish. So, um, Morgan, I mean, you gave us the intro and sort of set the stage. How do you really feel about sort of where this is? This is going to go. Well, you know, I, for one, and probably everyone here uh, is the same way, I never believed that this was going to go anywhere, and so it's it's not like uh, I'm particularly happy that it's failed or particularly heartbroken that it's failed because it never seemed uh, like a reasonable endeavor to me. It's going to cost uh, tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions of dollars to put people on the surface of Mars, and this seemed like a clever uh, publicity stunt, but uh, something that more belonged on Kickstarter than as a sort of believable way of... Um, of going to Mars. I, I think you're giving it too much credit saying Kickstarter. To me, this always felt like a bunch of kids selling lemonade to buy a Maserati. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think that you're all really mean. And <laughs> I think that you need to give it a little... You know, like, I think that, you know, my boss, uh, just fair disclosure, I, you know, I work for Hero X, which is a spin-off of the X-Prize. My boss, Peter Diamandis, came up with, uh, you know, with a... a crowdfunded, but, you know, eventually came up with, raised a prize, $10 million to get the a spacecraft into, you know, into space. Not into right. orbit, but into space. So, and, and everyone thought that was crazy. So I think that, that, that the idea to come up with something that is crazy is perfectly legitimate to gather grassroots support, to tap into the enthusiasm, and to put as much energy as you can in the right direction is the right way to go about this. You know, I imagine, and in even like some of the cool scientific experiments, some of the, you know, like let's grow plants on Mars, let's figure out some of the breathing apparatus, let's let's figure out some of the various pieces. And I sort of imagined three, four, five years down the road, Elon Musk coming in and saying, okay, great, we've got the rocket, you've put, you've built this amazing grassroots effort, let's merge our resources together and, you know, we'll consider all the candidates that you've already identified and all the, the, the groundwork that you've done. But then if they're getting money from the contestants, then it's all just... <laughs> so that's a part you're, that just... You're Elon Musk. I, 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 for one, believe in the power of Elon Musk to take us to Mars. Uh, I don't believe in Mars One. Yeah. But that's the thing, right? Like, what's the difference between Elon Musk doing it and Mars One doing it? Someone's built a rocket company to do it, right? And is Well, one of them has... Rockets. One of them actually has like high quality staff who applied for the job, were carefully honed, right. have gone. It, it all comes down to how do you pick who goes to Mars and actually doing the tests ahead of time. When they started canceling their tests, that's where I lost all hope for them. Right. Well, we will see how this continues to unfold. I suspect this isn't going to be the last time we'll be talking about it. Uh, so let's uh, let's sort of shift gears and talk about some some actual science. And uh, Lee, you've been tracking the uh, the oceans, the discovery of oceans on Ganymede, the potential. Just a little bit, yeah, yeah. So we can talk about that. Um, well, you know, it's important I think to emphasize first off that that we've essentially already known that that oceans were on Ganymede, and, and the real question was. Um, you know, obtaining more evidence for that. And the way that we thought there were oceans on Ganymede earlier, I believe, were through uh, various spacecraft flybys that have that have looked at the, um, you know, tried to estimate the density of of the moon, and, and they've come to the conclusion that that you know oh, there must be this, or, or you know, or actually maybe maybe some of it also has to do with the electrical conductivity that they're looking at under the surface. And anyway, the, the, not to get too bogged down the bin, uh, an ocean underneath Ganymede, just like uh, Jupiter's Europa and Jupiter's Callisto. And uh, and you know other moons that, that exist, for instance, around Saturn. We've thought that since I think like the, at least the 80s, if not the 70s, even. Uh, but, but this this was kind of the, the um, you know the, the cherry on top. Uh, this stuff that happened last week or was announced last week. And what it is is that they used uh, some scientists used the Hubble Space Telescope uh, to look at uh, the uh, uh, an ultraviolet aurora that that exists around Ganymede. Ganymede is so large that it um, it actually has its own magnetic field. And this interacts with Jupiter's immense magnetic field, uh, so that essentially, as as uh, as the moon is moving around Jupiter, uh, you're generating the skies every now and then, uh, except much fainter and only in ultraviolet, uh, for the interaction of these two magnetic fields. And, and through exactly the the way that this this magnetic field, or rather the aurora, is kind of rocking back and forth, 
as uh, Ganymede moves around the moon, you're able to deduce that, yes, there's this saltwater ocean uh, far beneath the surface. Um, I think it's on the order of like 150 kilometers, very deep down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the real message here is that water is everywhere. Liquid water is everywhere in our solar system. Uh, we, and, and it's in particularly, it, it's in the outer solar system where we haven't been really paying much attention for decades. Uh, you know, barring very, very large and expensive missions to go out and orbit Saturn, or visit Jupiter, things like that, or go to the edge of the solar system, we haven't been sending whole fleets and flotillas of spacecraft out there. We're all focused on Mars and a lot of the inner planets as better sites for life. And this is kind of turning that in its head. It's another piece of evidence saying, actually, the best place to look for life may not be Mars. Uh, it may actually be beneath the icy crusts of these moons, these large moons in the outer solar system. Very cool. Uh, I mean, I think, Pamela, you were at the, the LPSC meeting. Did they talk about this there? Uh, it wasn't just this. It was basically the fact that we're realizing there isn't a rocky world that hasn't been irradiated by the sun in the case of Mercury um, that doesn't potentially have water within its interior. Here on Earth, we likely have water locked down in our crust. And as we look at world after world after world, all of the bigger things seem to have water, whether it be Ceres, Ganymede, Enceladus, Europa. <sighs> Water's everywhere. Yeah, even, I mean, I've seen even potentially Pluto, Sedna, some of the real distant outer solar system objects could have liquid water through radioactive decay. So there's processes that can really get that water unlocked across the whole solar system. And, and this is causing us to rethink how we model worlds. And the other problem that we're running into is how do we explain all of the plumes that we're seeing? There had been early Hubble indications that Sirius may have plumes, and now we're finding this bright spot. Uh, there's a beautiful animation of it over on the Planetary Society blog. Um, and this bright spot can be clearly seen being brighter uh, when it's under direct sunlight and fading away as it falls away from the sun and also gets cooler. So, so now not we're an alien laser beam. Oh, we'll, we'll, actually, we'll, talk about this. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later. But, but so it, folks are working hard to figure out, okay, if you have an icy crust, you have heating inside, you have gravitational loading, uh, all of this plays together to potentially create jets through this really neat process where the surface actually cracks under the stress of having the ocean underneath. And just like uh, the surface of a pie cracking and slumping in, it could be that the surfaces of these worlds are cracking and slumping in, and that process is creating these plumes. So a lot of the talks that I saw were engaged in trying to figure out three basic processes. Where do plumes come from? Uh, how do we generate heat inside to explain uh, all the variety of things that we see? And what are all the different ways that the melting of impacts on surfaces affect all of this? As we look at surfaces, we're actually starting to try and figure out, are these icy or rocky based on the melt that surround, surrounds the craters, and we're finding more and more things that appear to be icy rather than rocky. And the great thing about these, all of these plumes that we're seeing is, is this is a process that's taking this water, potentially life-filled water, and pushing it out into space where we can take a look at it as it dies a horrible space death. But <clears throat> so this is just really bringing the astrobiology right to us. And, and Jim Green actually said during the NASA night discussion uh, that there will potentially be uh, everything's potential when Congress is involved. Um, there should be a call for a Europa mission uh, plan uh, cooperative agreement notice. And the question he asked all of us to think about is, how do you sample these fluids? How do you grab on and look for life. A great big car windscreen just driving <laughs> through them and they're just little bugs will splat on the windscreen. That is pretty much what they're planning but a little bit more technically complicated. Nobel Prize please. No. <laughs> right. You have to get the life first. Oh.
Okay, all right. Uh, well, that's pretty cool. Um, well, let's move on. Uh, Brian Koberlein, I would like to talk about uh, a post that you did about exoplanets, and I'm sure Lee's going to have lots to say about this, about okay. potentially using Bode's Law. Yes. Uh, Bode's Law is a pattern that was first observed in, uh, I think, the early 1800s on um, the distances of planets in our solar system. So if you go 4 plus a number, and that number would be 3, 6, 12, 24, and so forth, um, you can line them up. If you consider the distance of the Earth to be 10, uh, it seems to reasonably match where all the planets are, including Ceres, but not including Neptune. And at the time when Uranus and Neptune weren't known, it looked like a pattern with a missing gap, and then they found Ceres, and they thought, wow, this is really going to be something that's going to be useful. And it doesn't have any rhyme or reason why it works. It just kind of seems to kind of work. And when we found Neptune, uh, it kind of fell out of favor. But as we've come back to exoplanets, there have been some attempts to see whether or not something like Bode's Law would fit for exoplanets. And there's a little bit of controversy here because in, in some corners it's seen as basically just numerology, toss around enough numbers, and something will match. And so uh, what you get is there was a new paper that was out looking at a modified form of Bode's Law, which is allows you to fit it to planets. So that's already controversial because you're able to match it. But they tried matching it and they got that I think out of 151 exoplanetary systems with at least three planets, they had like 124, I think, that kind of matched as well as it does to our solar system or better. And then they used that to predict, uh, I think, 98 planets, 98 exoplanets. And when they went through the Kepler data, they found five. So five of the 98. Five of the 98 happened to hit. And so, you know, basically it's this, this pattern that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, but they found five planets with it. So it's, this is one of those things that I, I used in the title of throwing pasta against the wall to see if it sticks. You know, and sometimes it sticks, and most of all, you get a theoretical mess on the floor. But did they not find 93 planets? Did they fail to find 93 planets? Is it there's, those other 93 planets are there, or... Uh, no, they just don't have enough data, or they're definitely not there. You, you, I mean, you can't say they're definitely not there, but there's no reason to say that they are there, other than this kind of numerological pattern. So the thing is, they tried to use it as a predictive model, and they found that it it kind of matches some of the solar systems that we see, but when you try and do it to prediction, it worked, you know, five times out of ninety-eight. And, you know, that's not really good odds. And we have the same thing here, you know. I mean, if you looked in the solar system when it was first proposed, oh, look, it worked for Uranus. Yeah, Ceres, if you call it a planet, it kind of worked for Ceres. It didn't work for Neptune. And that's when you had, you know, a whole bunch of planets, and they're trying to do it with two or three. Well, I know this is a topic that really fascinates you, Lee. Wouldn't this just save us a lot of time? We can just imagine planets as opposed to having to actually look for them? Well, somewhat. I, I think I think Brian uh, covered it pretty well in terms of um, the relative uncertainties. It's important to notice and, and note, of course, that 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 there are probably a, a great deal. I would think of uh, undiscovered planets still in the Kepler data set. Uh, uh, things that, and when I say when I say undiscovered planets, I I'm referring to things that maybe uh, don't even transit, but through things like transit timing variations. We can detect their presence. Uh, so, so I think that just because you know they only found five out of 93, is, as, as Brian said, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that 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 these other planets aren't there necessarily. Um, I, you know, I was really torn about whether or not to write about this study this week, actually, and I ended up not doing it in part because uh, while it is kind of interesting and it is this example of throwing spaghetti at the wall, and 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 at the same time, we already know through other work that small planets are quite common in habitable zones around all sorts of stars. We already know that. Uh, and it's good to refine that if we can, but, but uh, you know, we already know that quite well. Um, we already know that, 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 uh, that archetypal planetary system 
it seems to have this, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say archetypal, but, but, but a lot of planetary systems out there seem to have these dynamically packed uh, orbital spacings where they're, they're as close together as they can be. And that's kind of a version almost of, of, of Bode's Law in a way, because mm-hmm. you're talking about an essentially kind of general logarithmic spacing that, that, that dictates right. the ruling of where planets are. So, so I just didn't really see a whole lot new in this study that really seemed... Um, significant in terms of like pushing us forward in terms of what we really know. Now again, you gotta throw the spaghetti at the wall. You gotta you gotta try wild ideas and see how they work out and they aren't all hits. Um, but I, yeah, I, I guess uh, I, I think it's very interesting. But the most interesting thing of all about it is, is how it's just an elaboration of what we already know. And, and the real thing we need to do, mm-hmm. I think, is obviously not to just um, you know keep, keep twiddling our theoretical thumbs. We need to develop the capabilities to go find these things and get a complete census of planetary systems and architectures around nearby stars. So that's what it's really pointing to. But I mean, this is one of those examples, we always talk about life and how, you know, we only have a data sample of one. And Bode's Law is an example where we have an example of a law, and we've only had a data sample of one solar system. Well, now we have a bigger data sample, and we can actually start to test these ideas against other solar systems and see whether they hold up or not. And Bode's Law you know, may help us find other planets, or it may just sit on the trash bin of, uh, of planetary motion. We, who knows where it's going to go? Well, uh, it, it's, it's actually more complicated even than, than I think get coming up right now, because planets don't stay put. Right. And one of the easy ways to, to imagine that, that Uranus failed was, um, according to the, the Nice model, with Jupiter and Saturn uh, previously uh, aligned so that they were resonant and how frequently they went around, things got flung all over the place. Mm-hmm. And it could be that the the Bode number actually works out um, as a result of expected resonances, but things sometimes don't quite make it to their anticipated place. It's an equation, just like Kepler's law, that has no reason for existing but seems to work. And until we understand what starts and stops planets' movement from their place of formation to where they land, it's hard to figure out, is this something that only works at different points in this process? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, I'm going to move on um, because I want to talk about the bright spots on Ceres, (laughs) and I want Morgan to talk about it. Yeah, Pamela has already uh, kind of teased us for this story, and I will go ahead here and share a picture of uh, the plumes uh, as they're now sort of suspected to be. And this was the big news that came out of the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference uh, this past week in Houston. And we've been watching these spots on series um, with interest now, I'd say, for weeks, if not months. And as we've gotten closer and closer with the Dawn spacecraft, they've slowly become a little bit clearer, but still uh, not very um, easy to see. Uh, But they produced some new results for LPSC that showed a really interesting result, which is the fact that these dots, whatever they might be, are not solely affixed to the bottom of the crater. And you might wonder how we could know that if we can't even see what is creating the dots. And what they did is they watched Ceres as it rotated. And what they noticed is that you could still see these white spots even when Ceres had rotated such that the rim of the crater was blocking our view of the floor of the crater. And so if these were two white circles painted on the floor of the crater, as soon as the rim gets in the way of our line of sight, they should disappear. But that's not what happens. We still persist on seeing them even when, uh, as scientists would say, uh, the crater is on what we call the limb of the planet or the edge. And that tells us that they must be uh, extending upwards from the, um, the floor of the crater. And what this has led people to believe is that we're seeing some sort of plume activity, like we've seen on Enceladus, uh, like Hubble suggested should be happening, or could be happening on Ceres in uh, past observations. And what strengthens this is uh, what Pamela alluded to, which is the fact that we see what's called a diurnal variation. Uh, of the brightness of these things, which means that they're brighter during the day and they're dimmer at night. And this is more than just the change in illumination. Uh, 
lighting up or, or darkening a bright spot on, on the surface. Uh, what it looks like might be happening here is when the sun shines directly into this crater and onto these spots, uh, it heats up that area, and that somehow causes uh, whatever generates these white spots to be more active, uh, whether that's melting or plume or... Um, or some sort of sublimation, and then as the crater turns away from the sun and the sun's rays become uh, less directly focused on it, uh, whatever that effect is starts to ebb away, and we can see this going uh, in cycles uh, on serious days. But if this is, is a plume, as, as you're talking about now, uh, doesn't that make it one of the most dramatic events in the entire solar system? Like, it's visible by the Hubble Space Telescope, it's, it would be huge. It would certainly be dense. That's the most important thing. Uh, even if you look directly at Enceladus, you can't see the plumes coming off of Enceladus. You have to catch them in just the right uh, angle for the sun, basically, to light them up. Uh, and yet we know a tremendous amount of water is coming out of those plumes on Enceladus. They create the entire E-ring of Saturn, we believe. Uh, and so whether the plume, the supposed plume, uh, on uh, Ceres is large in size, it must be at least dense enough to reflect light back towards the spacecraft from pretty much every angle. And that's something that we haven't seen anywhere else in the solar system uh, up and, until I mean, this point. And if confirmed, that would make Ceres the most interesting place to search for life pretty much in the whole solar system, just like that. It's, you know, it's, it's relatively close, easier to get to than out to Saturn or, you know, out to Jupiter or out to Pluto. It's you know, uh, it's, it's clearly creating a very dense cloud, a very easy target to try and fly your spacecraft through. It's, it's kind of amazing. It, that's If these plumes are the result of a liquid water ocean, uh, they could, although it seems unlikely, be the result of some sort of sublimation uh, or other process that wouldn't necessarily indicate persistent liquid water uh, underneath the surface. Uh, but uh, Dawn is just making its approach to Ceres, uh, and is going to get a lot closer and be able to study these a lot more uh, in depth, eventually imaging the region that these uh, objects seem to be emanating from at a resolution of 30 meters. Uh, and today we're still talking about, you know, kilometers. Uh, and so we're going to get a much better picture of this, and that'll really help us understand whether we're looking at uh, something that's caused by a possible under-surface uh, ocean or not. Pamela, when you were at LPSC, uh, were people uh, freaking out and losing their minds no, at, so, at what they were seeing? No, this this was actually a really uh, interesting talk to be there. Uh, I wasn't in the room when it happened, but to be at the conference for, because the scientist who gave the talk that is being discussed stood up at the beginning of his talk and said, please do not tweet these results. Um, it was put under embargo. Scientists were allowed to do that. And people who walked into the room late didn't know about that embargo and went, holy shit, and started tweeting everything they heard. So all the results that we're, get, that we're hearing about come from people who didn't hear the beginning of the talk. Um, and, and so we're really at the stage of um, something cool that is not uh, seen a second time that hasn't been confirmed, where the scientist was trying to put this out for the rest of the community to say, hey, this is what's coming, be prepared. Um, we're going to have to do a lot of work to understand this. Um, has instead turned into discussions of, hey, this could indicate there's life, when um, it's, you, you can imagine how the poor science team feels having asked please keep this under embargo. Good luck with that. Well, it was also reported, though, by science and nature. It wasn't just scientists tweeting it out. Journalists, you know, accredited journalists in, in the audience uh, were reporting uh, on the story as well. They didn't feel that they were covered by uh, this so-called um, sort of scientist uh, microblogging embargo. Uh, right. So we are, we are getting a full picture of what was said uh, in the room, but that doesn't mean that that's a full picture as the scientists have it uh, well, or would like us to know. And, and the concern is the scientists actually didn't want the press or the microbloggers or anybody else discussing this. As far as the scientist giving the presentation was concerned, he was presenting completely embargoed results. And so the conversation that kept coming up at LPSC was not about this amazing science, but about this new era that we live in where, unlike the past, um, it used to be you could stand up, give a talk, and say this is embargoed, 
and everyone would pay attention to that and apparently that's no longer true and sadly that was what dominated the discussion at the meeting was not the science but the fact that this was supposed to be kept under embargo and is now being discussed here as a hey this is awesome new science yeah I, I think I speak for all journalists when I say too bad um, this is but then you know I famously have uh, ignore all embargoes so um, but uh, I, you know, I just think that that the science is amazing, and I think that the scientific community needs to have more trust in the journalists who are working on this to be able to put this in context and be able to ask the right questions and to be able to start, you know, helping the public digest the amazing to watch the mystery unfold. That we want to help people see the first insights and then watch as the science starts to get a better sense of what's going on. We can handle it. They can handle it. The public can handle it. I'm. I think. That, that's all well and good, but funders and publishers can't handle it. So when these results get put out there ahead of time, suddenly your university doesn't want to put out a press release. Your funders are like, hey, this wasn't really talked about that much. So this has much deeper implications than telling the story wrong. Well, and now well, we're I mean, talking about it. It just seems to me it should be beholden upon, I mean, shouldn't it be beholden upon the, the scientists to, if they want to keep it hush-hush, they should probably not talk about it at a meeting that's attended by hundreds of people. Well, and, and this is a change in philosophy. It used to be, literally, yeah. 10 years ago you stood up, you said these results are embargoed, this is early results, and everybody respected that across the board. But this was right. in the days before microblogging and tweeting, where the worst you had to worry about was one person talking to somebody else at another university. But and now that we're in this... Yeah modern age, unfortunately, the historical, we use conferences to discuss pre-publication results that may be proven completely wrong. Right. Nowadays, it may get to the point that we can't actually, as scientists, have those conversations anymore. Yeah. They might want to use Snapchat and just snap <laughs> pictures of each other, you know? It would be a good, legitimate use of Snapchat. It, in some ways, it makes scientists, it makes it harder for us to do our jobs. Yeah. Because we want to have these conversations where it's like, okay, here's a BS idea. I'm going to toss this out. Shoot me down. And right. you don't want that to be in the press. You want to be able to toss out the ideas, figure out where the flaws are, and then how you can best present an accurate picture of what you found. It's, it's almost like you know, you've now got the press in your office when, when you're talking to colleagues while the research is going on. That's terrifying. Well... Yeah. It's terrifying right now because we're dealing with the transition from the old world to the new world. But I think at the same time, a lot of scientists have really benefited from putting their ideas out there and getting uh, people who they never know who's going to show up and be able to give them some actual value. Now, obviously, you're also going to get a bunch of cranks and woo-woos, spew all kinds of garbage at you, but... I think in the end, more transparency is is always better, and I think that's you know that's what Pamela, that's what we do with CosmoQuest, right. right? Which is that we want to let the public get involved in the science as early as possible, and we would love for somebody as they're doing moon mappers to find a crazy, weird boulder or strange structure and pass that along to a scientist to be able to study it more deeply. So. The, the issue is when you're wrong. I mean, we, we mm -hmm. all can look back at the Mono Lake mistake that NASA made a few years ago when they said, we have found life that does not require the same chemistry, the extremophile press conference. That press conference was a mistake, and that scientist is now openly mocked by the media for being part of a press conference where what she was actually doing is saying, hey, I have this result, I need help confirming this result, and mm -hmm. half the media on the planet said, extremophile life made of different chemicals has been found. Mm -hmm. So it's it's unfortunately this is the grayest of grays. And until we get to the point that scientists can give early results without being mocked, defunded, and having their careers severely harmed because they were transparent, we have to worry. Mm -hmm. well, well, is there a middle ground that can be found here? Uh, because in a lot of these things, you have you know you and your small group at, at your university, and you have these large conferences like uh, LPSC or the AGU or the AAS. Uh, but often in the middle are workshops that are specific to a particular um, discipline or science team meetings for a particular spacecraft. I'm sure Don has missions for people within their own. Um, 
instrument teams, and could that offer sort of an intermediate place where you could sound off these ideas to a larger group than just the people that you interact with every day, uh, but not have the expect expectation that they'll be disseminated publicly. But when you go to LPSC big, was that smaller conference. Yeah, Morgan, yeah. I, LPSC I find was lots that of smaller stories. conference. Yeah, I find lots of stories from those conferences, and and we report on them. Yeah. So, in fact, those are my favorites because then I get a scoop, right? I get something that nobody else is talking about. Like, oh, this these right. this team is proposing this really interesting idea to use nuclear propulsion, and and I like to sort of consider those ideas. So, I think that we need to have journalists be better is a big part of it, right? Journalists have to not suck. They need to do a good job of reporting and really accurately getting across this idea that we live in a, in a that, that scientists, it's okay for scientists to throw out BS ideas and for, for people to just, you know, take a crack at them and that, that doesn't make the science bad, doesn't make the scientists bad. It's, it's for us to explore really interesting ideas. And then I think the well, scientists think. need to be able to be more comfortable with, with actually getting those, you know, Blurring that line between what is embargoed and what is what is widely available, it's a it's a process, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and not, not not we need to we don't need to dwell on it too much, but you know, the, who's a journalist, Fraser? Right? I mean, the, yeah. the, everyone's a journalist now, and, and so so uh, unquote like real journalists, like people like us who are, who are responsible and how they try to report things, and they're cognizant of of what their reports and their coverage can do to careers and ideas. Um, you know, they aren't the only ones who are in the mix, and but we still have an obligation. So, you know, all it takes is one person uh, tweeting something, tweeting a screenshot of of a presentation, or tweeting a quote from someone, and that's out that's out in the public then, right? And yeah. so then it's it's our job as responsible journalists to cover that because it is out in the public domain at that point. So, I mean, it is a really yep. slippery slope. The greatest of grays, as Pamela said, yep. I really think yep. <laughs> nails it. It's, yeah. I don't quite know what the answers are. No, it's true, and I think. In the short term, we could be responsible, and you know, I I don't report a million things because of that exact reason, which I, I can see the context and I can see that we need to be respectful of what's going on. Uh, and speaking of respectful, let's move on to another story. Um, uh, Brian, I want to talk about uh, long-lasting planets that could have chaotic orbits, and you shamelessly brought in some kind of show, some kind of Game of Thrones show, to really talk about this. <laughs> Yeah, winter is coming. Uh, <laughs> so tell us, how could Game of Thrones be real? Well, this is uh, this was a, a work in which they uh, the team was actually looking at computer simulations of planetary systems, and you know one of the things that traditionally what we'd see as a solar system would be fairly stable. So you have a very stable orbits. And, and even small perturbations may change them a little bit. We've known that in the early formation of our solar system, for example, the planets have shifted dramatically. But the idea has been that if you really want to have long-lasting long planetary systems, the planetary orbits should probably be stable and not chaotic. And what this new work did was that it found, it looked at the computational simulations of a whole bunch of planetary systems and it found that you can have planetary systems that are both long-lived and chaotic. And in fact, you can have planets that would have chaotic orbits within the habitable zone of that star system. So it would be something like having a planet like Earth being chaotic between the orbits of Venus and Mars. And so you may have periods of extremely hot weather and extreme, extremely cold weather. Very long summers and very long winters, for example. Right, or just of long, you know, hot, hot years for 100 years and then cold years for 500 years. And, it, you know, it could oscillate dramatically. And this is something that we didn't necessarily expect because you would expect that whatever the orbits are, they would kind of settle into place. And that chaotic, chaos is kind of bad for long-lived planets. And what this new work is showing is that, in fact, you can have chaotic planets that that still last on the order of 10 billion years. Now, is it possible that this might have some of the, the people searching for extrasolar planets to go back and look at their data and maybe some candidates that they could have thrown out because now they've got, you know, that they thought, well, that's weird. It didn't show up on schedule, so it can't be legit. Yeah, it... it, it 
it changes kind of the way we would look for exoplanets because a lot of times within the data you you put up possible candidates and then you try and see if those orbits are stable and you say the strongest signals with the most stable orbits are those are the ones that are likely to be planets and if you can't confirm that they would be stable orbits then you may be seeing signals that you're not lo you're not catching because you think oh well it's unstable I wouldn't be able to find it very cool. So I think the uh, real the real takeaway of this work is uh, oh sorry oh, go go ahead go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, there's a little, little bit of lag, so that's why. But yeah, um, the uh, I think the real implications of this are, are not to really add planets to um, to our retinue uh, when we're thinking about places that are promising for habitability and life. I think it's actually the mm -hmm. exact opposite. It's to say right. that that planets that can now exist in habitable zones and even be on seemingly circular orbits could have in their past experienced um, these chaotic, I mean, they could still be chaotic, but they in their past could have had um, much, much less clement conditions for life. So, so that's something that we see right. now, uh, you know, 13.8 billion years into the universe's existence that's on this really nice placid orbit around a star and seems to be a great place, could just be terrible, to, uh, a terrible yeah. place to look for life based on things that have happened earlier in its history, which is, right. which is in keeping with uh, one of the researchers here, uh, Rory Barnes, who did this work, um, is kind of known as the uh, the destroyer of worlds uh, <laughs> in the field because he so often will find ways to essentially take any nice looking planet that you can find and, and based on you know just the slimmest uh, bit of data that you have on it say oh actually well this thing could be hellacious and terrible and could have gone through all kinds of nastiness earlier in its life so um, it may be uh, it's good that we can see this and know that it's there the question as to whether or not it's good or bad for the search for life I guess is kind of um, mm. Uh, it depends on your perspective. Do you have any indication on just how common these things might be? Like, is there, you know, is there going to be one of these in every solar system? Is there going to be one in a hundred? Do they know yet? I'm not sure what the ratio is. I think they were they were largely focusing on, you know, can you have chaotic orbits, or do they have to be stable orbits? Yeah. Uh, Morgan, you're a, you're a ring guy. Uh, and now they found a ring around another asteroid, maybe. Yeah, just like we're suddenly realizing that water is everywhere in the solar system, it turns out that it's possible that rings are everywhere in the solar system as well. For the longest time, we knew of only one ring system, and that was, of course, the rings around Saturn. Uh, but as telescopes got stronger and spacecraft observations uh, spread outwards, we discovered rings around Jupiter, around Uranus, and around Neptune. Uh, and then just last year, uh, we discovered sort of the first new ring system in a long time. And that was around uh, an object known as a centaur, which is an, ob which is, uh, an asteroid that orbits between uh, the orbits of some of the major planets. Uh, in this case, it was between Saturn and Uranus. And this was uh, the asteroid Cheriklo. Uh, and Cheriklo was uh, discovered long ago, but just recently stellar occultation observations showed that uh, it could have one or maybe even two thin, tenuous rings around it. And we were, uh, in the community, we're all really excited about this because it offered the first new data uh, in a long time. Uh, and then in a paper published uh, just this past week, uh, we get uh, another of these uh, centaurs with a possible ring system around it. Uh, and this was uh, the asteroid known as Chiron. Uh, and so now we have two well-known large uh, centaurs, both that have uh, ring systems or possible ring systems. They're not certain yet that Chiron has a ring system uh, out there. And this is starting to make people wonder, well, could there be a lot of ring systems out there around uh, asteroids, both in the asteroid belt and uh, in other parts of the solar system? Um, good. So let's find more. Um, I don't know what else to say. We found rings. We found rings around two asteroids now. There's probably going to be a bunch more. Um, would they make good way stations for spacecraft to refuel because the uh, ice would just be like right there to pick up? The, the issue is they don't have enough gravity to orbit them. So you have this problem that, that Rosetta is currently experiencing and that OSIRIS-REx is going to experience when it gets to Bennu. Uh, these objects don't exert enough gravity that you can slide into an orbit around them, but rather you have to use maneuvering thruster, thrusters to put yourself in an orbit around the sun that is 
parallel to the orbit of the object you care about and maneuver yourself with those rockets to get to whatever part of it you want to see. Uh, using maneuvering rockets to maneuver around chunks of ice and dust seems like an extremely poor idea if you like yourself in your spacecraft. Boy, you didn't have to say it was an extremely poor idea, Pamela. That was, that was a bridge I'm too I'm sorry. Far. I just scienced no, you. No, no. No, no. I understand. You scienced me. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, let me see if... Uh, I think those are all the stories that we had. Actually, one last quick story. One, uh, there was a uh, solar eclipse yeah. just a few hours ago in northern Europe, and apparently the worst possible weather for northern Europeans. And, very few people saw the actual eclipse yeah. straight up. I, I'm expecting all of us here in North America, none of us saw it, so... Um, so congratulations better. to all of you. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, 2017? 2017. 2017, yeah. we're like 900 and something days away now. So it's, yeah. it's like you can see it from my house, so doors open to everyone. In the Hangout, those of you outside of the Hangout, my campus will be open. You may wish to take that back. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, congratulations to all of you who saw the eclipse. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone saw a uh, polar bear attacked a uh, tourist. Were they trying to see the eclipse? I didn't know that. I yeah. thought they were just out, you know, hanging out in the Arctic. No, I think they were there oh. for the eclipse. Yeah, and a polar bear attacked attacked someone. Oh. Yeah, and they they put the polar bear down. So that was not so good. <laughs> Uh, so we got about four minutes left. Uh, I w we got a million more stories from the good folks from the WSH crew. This is the Google Plus community that uh, surrounds us and sends a lot of stories our way. We tried to pull as many of them out as we could, but if you are looking for an amazing community on Google Plus that relates directly to the show that you're watching right now, go check out the go check out the WSH crew, the Weekly Space Hangout crew. It's a small community, but they are dedicated, they are uh, fearsome, and uh, they should be respected. So uh, go and check them out. And well, in they... fact, a uh, little known secret that I'm going to tell you right now, they are actually responsible for choosing the special guests for this show. So um, I've placed all of the power and responsibility in the hands of the WSH crew to find us guests. So... Uh, so that's if you want to be a sort of part of, of that, definitely go join the go join that community on Google Plus. Uh, let's see if we can get a few more questions here. Um, <clears throat> Hugo Burnham asks, man, we're going to have a bunch of this stuff about scientists and journalists, so so just be ready. Um, uh, <laughs> Hugo Burnham asks, doesn't any sort of embargo conflict with the very nature of peer-reviewed science? Pamela, no, actually, the the embargo simply says. Uh, these are early results. We're asking for time to make uh, not a fool of ourselves. So please hold tight, and this will be coming. So, so the idea mm -hmm. is the this is the alpha release only to your staff that happens with software. Except in this case, it's to the whole science community that happens to be in the room. We're asking for help. We don't want to look foolish. So please keep this quiet for now. Once enough of you have said, I'm not actually making a fool of myself, then we'll move forward. Um, it also gives them a chance to get the publication for their work. One of the, the extreme concerns, especially with this story, is these guys worked years and years, in some cases decades out of their lives. They want to be the ones to publish the results. And what can happen and what the real fear will happen is other teams will start downloading the images now from the press sites and beat the team that is frantically trying to control the spacecraft to publication because since they aren't controlling the spacecraft, uh, they can dedicate all their time to the science. And essentially you're saying, hey, you spent all these dec decades building these toys, now we're going to take away your chance to do science. Yeah. Steve Harvey asks, uh, says, they need the Mars mission to be a success to set a precedent for further missions. Otherwise, it will turn the tap off to funding and set us back decades. So, Lee, what do you think about that? That, that, that the problem with Mars One is that they have sort of gathered all the low-hanging fruit, all the enthusiasm for Mars exploration, and then potentially, you know, soiled it. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess I would contest Steve's um, 
Steve's suggestion that that somehow this this private effort is going to somehow cut off the tap necessarily for other efforts. I mean, even though that, that is the fear, the fear is that they could poison the well somehow. Uh, but but they certainly haven't marshaled the entirety of the uh, of all the the human excitement that exists around going to Mars. Uh, they've only captured the barest fraction of it. Uh, and depending on which port reports you believe, you know, they've had what on the order of uh, two hundred thousand people beginning their application process. Some people say as few as two, uh, it was only two thousand. Well, well, only no, two thousand no, seemed to have completed it, the process. Yeah, it was like two hundred thousand people have applied. Hundreds of thousands of people. But the point is, is that's still so small. That's still so small. And, and there's so many people out there who are like me or, or like other folks who would love to go to Mars or see someone go to Mars and believe passionately in it and didn't, they, they didn't sign on. So so I, I don't think that it's kind of Mars 1 or bust, right? Um, so that's all I can say. I, 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 I wish him the best. I, I just don't think it's going to end well. Um... And, and I, I will put in, I've seen several stories saying that the original several hundred thousand number that they used was false. And people on the inside are now stepping forward and saying, no, it was only somewhere between two and 3,000 people that actually applied. Hmm. So there was a misinformation supplied that got all of us very excited. Uh, Sev Despony asks this for Brian. Uh, could the idea of these chaotic orbits support the idea of planetary migration during the life of a solar system, hence hot Jupiters? With the orbits mm -hmm. later becoming more stable, so so is this maybe one explanation for why we see such unusual solar systems? This is this is related to the same type of thing in which we know that planetary systems migrate. We know in our own solar system, and we know in others. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's the idea that solar systems are stationary and the planets stay where they form is false. We know that really well now. All right. Well, so we're at uh, one o'clock now. So why don't we uh, why don't we wrap this up? Um, people, where do we find out more? Brian Koberlein, where can people find out more about what you're working on? Uh, you can find me at uh, one universe at a time, which is BrianKoberlein.com, where you can find daily posts and a new podcast, the One Universe at a Time podcast. Uh, episode two comes out tomorrow. You can find me on Twitter at Brian Koberlein, and you can find me on Google Plus. And and if you would like to support me financially, you can donate to my Patreon fund, which is... Everybody laughs when I say that. We're laughing that. at how pain you see. We're laughing at Frazier. I'm laughing at Frazier. <laughs> awesome. Patreon.com yes. slash Brian Coberlein. Yes. The reluctant and, scientist. And support him out. Uh, support him. All right. Uh, Morgan Renberg, where do we find out more? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, at Morgan Renberg. Uh, you can find me at CosmicChatter.org. And uh, right after the show, you can find me over at the Google Plus Space community, uh, taking the rest of your questions that I'm sure um, we didn't get to this week or last week when I was in sunny Monterey or the week before when Frazier was moving cross-country. So we got a lot of pent-up stories to talk about. Uh, let's chat about them over on the Google Plus Space community. Awesome. So once again, Google Plus Space community, Morgan will take all comers. Uh, Dr. Pamela Gay, where do we find out more? Uh, you can find out more and actually help me do science over at CosmoQuest.org. We are pretty much supported through your donations right now. So donate to CosmoQuest.org slash donate uh, to keep our programs going and keep helping people like yourselves participate in uh, using NASA data to create published science results. Now I understand you're a glutton for punishment. Yes. And you're going to uh, perform for a, a very long period of out time. Athon. The yes. third hangout. What have you not learned a lesson? Well, so I, I actually learned a very important lesson. If I stay awake for 36 hours, people donate enough money to keep me having a job right now. As I said, we're supported primarily through donations right now. Um, in, in year three, post NASA sequestration, our funding is significantly less. Uh, not because we're not doing awesome work, but because NASA simply hasn't given out any new money and uh, canceled a lot of the programs that were funding us midstream. So, What's the date? On, 
April 25-26. We are inviting all of you to join us for 36 hours of doing science and hopefully helping fund science. We have great door prizes. We're pulling in corporate sponsors. Uh, Universe Today is going to be donating some meteorites. We have Celestron on board. Uh, lots of cool companies helping to support what we're doing and we're hoping that you'll show up and I can safely announce we will have a Mars Citizen Science project launched by then and we will be racing the worlds to see uh, during that 36 hours uh, which world you map the most of Mercury, Mars, the Moon or the asteroid Vesta. Awesome. All right. And uh, Lee, since you uh, special guest this week, uh, tell us where we can find out more. Well, I just want to say that everything I've heard from everyone else sounds way cooler um, than what I'm up to. I, you can find my stuff at scientificamerican.com or in the magazine on the newsstands. Um, you can go to, um, me, you can find me on Twitter at Lee Billings. Um, you can you can buy my book and get inside my head. Uh, and but I, I'm not doing any any deliberate 36-hour um, um, uh, sleepless marathons uh, if I can help it. But, but we'll see. Maybe the future will hold that too. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely uh, go dig up uh, Lee's book, f uh, Five Billion Years of Solitude, and uh, and support and support his work as well as uh, uh, read all his material on Scientific American. Uh, that would be that would be great. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for joining us this week. Thanks everyone for watching. We really appreciate all the questions. Sorry we couldn't get to as many as we wanted to. There's a ton of great questions. I'm reading them and I will take them to my grave. So, uh, thank you everyone for watching. We will see you all next week. Thank you.